but the Luftwaffe was experimenting with new forms of propulsion. The Messerschmitt 163 had revolutionary features, rocket power, swept back wings, and no tail, a new shape designed purely for speed. There was no room in the wings for a retractable undercarriage, so the wheels were designed to fall away after takeoff. Its fuel was a volatile cocktail of hydrogen peroxide, hydrazine hydrate, methyl alcohol, and water. Pilots had to be protected against the fuel which would dissolve them. The aircraft was tricky to handle, and new pilots had yet another problem. There were no two-seat training versions, so their first flight had to be made alone. The rocket plane was so secret that seeing it for the first time came as quite a shock to its pilots. After I had been taken into the hangar and had seen the bird, I was very excited. It was simply a winged plane driven by a rocket. The exhaust was roughly a little longer than a sewing machine. Two men could lift the motor in and out, but the power was enormous. The thrust of the rocket motor was approximately 1,700 kilos. That was around 6,000 horsepower power not available to fighter aircraft up until that time. Test pilots like Hannah Reich learned to love the plane. And I can only tell you it was fascinating. It was like thundering through the skies, sitting on a cannon ball, like being intoxicated by speed. It was only an overwhelming impression. boundary you already reached about 500 miles per hour and with constant speed you were climbing up in one and a half to two minutes into a height of 30,000 feet. The concept was quite unique. 163 was an electrifying aircraft because it had this startling rate of climb. Normal fighters had a rate of climb for about 3,000 feet a minute. The 163 was climbing at 14,000 feet a minute initially. But of course, on the other side of the balance was the fact that it had very limited endurance. And indeed, at the throttle was held at full power from the rocket. It only had three minutes. In the closing stages of the war, the Messerschmitt 163 was used to intercept Allied bombers. Its scoring rate was disappointing, but it startled Allied crews. Two of them hit us. Actually, they appeared like a, a bat with the, the white exhaust coming out. And all of a sudden, they turned and they came down vertically. And I realized that that was something different. And for, for a moment, I was wondering, is this the, the secret weapon that Hitler's always saying he's going to hit us with? They just amazed us, because they could outmaneuver and outrun any airplane that we had at the time. Pilots had to make their final approach without engine power. Their landing was done on the skid. It was dangerous to land in any fuel aboard. And they had a lot of accidents. In fact, 80% of their losses were on takeoff or landing. On one occasion, Hannah Reich had to land with the wheel still attached. I had to come to approach the airfield in a greater height as normally, but this destroyed the whole airflow because it was only wing without tail plane. It came out of control and crashed in the field. It was completely demolished in my head. Uh, 
came to an instrument and I suffered. Uh, my nose was, I have an artificial nose and it's a quadruple of fractured head and, and vertebra broken and many things. So after having been five months hospitalized, I was well again, spurned on by the only burning wish to continue as test pilot again. Test flying was often just as hazardous with another new propulsion system, the jet engine. The jet was to open up a new era in the quest for speed. Germany was the first country to have jet-powered aircraft flying, but the creator of the jet engine was a young Royal Air Force officer, Frank Whittle. He patented the engine in 1930, but the British Air Ministry was slow to see the possibilities. He was kept starved of resources and progress was painfully slow. His counterpart in Germany freely acknowledges Whittle's lead. If the Air Ministry would not have denied support to Sir Frank, he could have brought to work a jet engine at least four years earlier that would have been a deterrent for Hitler to go into Poland and risk a war with England and France. Hans von Ohain worked for Heinkel. By 1941, they were building a prototype fighter, the 280. Messerschmitt was building another. The German Air Ministry was more supportive of new ideas than its British counterpart, but there was skepticism about jet propulsion in Germany too. Even the commander of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, was slow to appreciate its value. They thought these are Heinkel's play toys which have no future. Also the imagination of the war would be very short and in that time it would be won by normal piston engines. The Heinkel was ready first and flying at over 500 miles an hour. But it was the rival Messerschmitt, the 262, with its longer endurance, which went into mass production as a fighter. Pilots finally got their hands on it late in 1944. For me, it was all sunshine. I felt like an emperor. When I was in a 109 together with 10 mosquitoes, then I had no chance. But with the 262, I was laughing. I took off, left the mosquitoes and the Mustang standing. Naturally, the disadvantages showed up on operations. It was difficult for us to find a good position from which to shoot at the opponent, because the difference in speed could not be reduced. And so it often happened that we flew right past opponents without having a chance to shoot at them, simply because we were too fast. Without any question, the ME-262 was the most formidable aircraft of World War II. Believe me, it looked rather like a shark. It looked ferocious and yet exciting. Once it was airborne, it was in a class of its own. Group Captain Eric Brown flew captured 262s after the war. Their jet engines had, to the best of our knowledge, a scrap life of 25 hours. Because at that stage of development, of course, the German engines were very shaky. And, of course, without documentation, there was always that slightly nervous feeling that you were perhaps flying a jet engine with 24 hours and 50 minutes on it. But the Germans, having lost command of the skies, took a more realistic view. Why should the engine live forever when the pilot would be killed with the airplane in combat much sooner? 
At over 600 miles an hour, Messerschmitt's rocket-powered 163 and jet-powered 262 were the fastest aircraft of the war. In Britain, war had jolted the air ministry into action. The first flight of a British jet came in 1941, the experimental E-2839. By the summer of 1944, the first Gloucester Meteor jet fighters were in squadron service. The Meteor was slower than the German aircraft, but in 1945, one of them set a new official speed record of 606 miles an hour. Whittle's engine was more powerful and more reliable than those in Germany and there was great hope in the country for its future. To the birthplace of the jet are coming students from all the world to take their first peep at this child of Britain's brains. Today, manpower and money on a national scale are flowing into its development. For in this latest wonder of applied science, Britain sees a source of her future wealth and welfare. But after the war, a new fight began. We suddenly found ourselves competitive with our allies because the enemy had evaporated. And it became a race, quite frankly, between the Americans and ourselves to be the first to break the sound barrier, which was the big goal in those days. The sound barrier, of course, presented a tremendous challenge to both scientists and pilots. To scientists, it was something like akin to splitting the atom. To pilots, it was rather like climbing Mount Everest because the goal was tremendously prestigious. Frank Whittle had started on an engine to power a supersonic aircraft during the war. By injecting extra fuel directly into the jet pipe, he increased its power. It was developed in great secrecy for the experimental Miles M52. But once again, Whittle's hopes were dashed. Everything was going well. The airplane was almost complete. The power plant was virtually complete. Then the ministry cancelled the project. And the reason they gave was that it was too dangerous to risk a pilot in a supersonic aeroplane. It burns me up to think uh, of the way we gave away the lead in supersonic flight. I'm confident that had the M52 reached completion, we would have been the first to fly supersonically. The British government now put its faith in a new high-speed research aircraft from the de Havilland Company the DH-108, the Swallow. Its tailless, swept-wing design owed a lot to captured German aircraft. Its purpose was to explore flying at close to the speed of sound, where pilots fought for control against buffeting and turbulence. On a test flight over the Thames estuary, the DH-108 broke up in mid-air killing Geoffrey de Havilland's eldest son.